Happy Sabbath morning to everyone here in Centerville, Ohio. It's, I'm looking out. It's a beautiful Sabbath morning here in the month of May. I think it's going to be a fairly warm one today. So I hope you and your family and your friends will be blessed uh, with the presence of God on the day that he selected for us all the way at the beginning from creation. Let us pray and then we'll go into our lesson study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your presence here in the midst of this virus. And we know as we look for today, we have hope in tomorrow and in the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be with us today as we study your word about the Bible, sola scriptura, scripture and scripture alone. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, our, we are at Lesson 5, By Scripture Alone, Sola Scriptura. And of course, the principle of Sola Scriptura comes from the Protestant Reformation, which was inaugurated back in 1517 by Martin Luther. Luther was a priest of the Dominican Order of the Roman Catholic Church. He was a great teacher, preacher, and he was very... I should say, agitated by some of the unbiblical doctrines which he believed that his church was following them. Uh, indulgences and purgatory were two that he had a lot of problems with. Indulgences is where the church and got its money by telling people that if you put money in as an indulgence, you can pray your family or friends out of purgatory into heaven, which meant if you did not give money, they would remain in purgatory and may even face the eternal torment of the fires of hell. Uh, he also did not like the emphasis on relics when they would kind of bring into these small German towns pieces of wood or nails that were supposedly taken from the real cross at Calvary and Luther felt this was a horrible way to fleece these poor German peasants out of their money. Um, so as we look at this, he focused on the doctrine of the Bible and the Bible only, for doctrine and for the way of living. In many ways, Martin Luther discovered the writings of Paul on justification by faith that had basically been buried by the, the medieval Catholic Church at that time, Luther being a great scholar of languages, uh, and in many ways he was a great scholar like Paul was, was able to bring forth Paul's message of salvation as a gift, totally apart from any type of ordinances or indulgences. It is a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that was really, in many ways, the foundational element behind Luther's appeal and why it was such a threat to the medieval Catholic Church at that time. Now, it says here on Saturday's lesson, what is sola scriptura? It means scripture alone is the final authority when matters of faith and doctrine are at issue. And it has certain fundamental principles because we're all different. We can all read the Bible in some ways differently, but there are such eternal principles and truths that while we may differ on certain other things, we can agree that this book is to be our guide for our teaching and on how we live our life because it was given under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, written over 66 books, over a period of around, over, I think, around 1,700 years. And there's a type of unity to this. Let's go to Monday's lesson. Scripture as the ruling norm. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, and looking at just verses 5 and 6. He's writing to the church at Corinth. And he's dealing with some issues going on in the church. We need to remember, those of us who love Paul and study Paul's theology, Paul's letters 
We're dealing with specific things, specific issues that were going on in the church at that time. And so his main theme, while he would have great theology, because he's mainly talking about, remember when I was with you, here is what I taught you. These letters are a way to deal with division and problems in most of his churches. And so he's dealing here on passing judgment on others, trying to read the motives of others. And so as we look at verses 5 and 6, Paul says this, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. <clears throat> See, in the Corinthian church we know Paul feels and fears there are three types of factions in that church. Paul's followers, followers of Peter, and followers of Apollos. And one of the things Paul is saying, there should not be division at all. People within the Corinthian church, super apostles, are trying to latch on to certain things that maybe Peter taught, Apollos taught, and saying they are more supreme than what that interloper Paul is talking about. Here clear, clearly Paul is saying, look, Apollos and I, we agree on this. We agree on this. You're not to exceed what is written. So clearly in Paul's letters, in Apollo's letters, in Apollos' letters, which clearly Paul has some familiarity with and knows, he's saying, do not exceed what is written so that no one will become arrogant and bring division and judgment. And of course, that's a problem all of us in our fallen states has. We study on a topic, we want to share it with others, and if we're guided by the Holy Spirit, and with the spirit of humility, bringing it forward and maybe being corrected, encouraged by others, that is a way that we can get understanding, sometimes new light, as long as our basis is Scripture. However, if I believe this is something God gave only, only to me, and I am better than others, and they need to bow down to me and just agree with me, and anyone who disagrees with me, I would say, well, you're going against what God told me. That's where problems arise. And so it is with a spirit of humility. The entire idea of Sola Scriptura is that the Scripture teaches us you do not have to be an authority on languages to understand the basic principles of Scripture. And a German peasant in medieval times, and let's say a Kansas farmer today, have enough wisdom and discernment, as any preacher or teacher does, to know what is the clear word of God. And that's one of the key things, the background of Sola Scriptura is the priesthood of all believers. Yes, you know, hopefully some of us who've had some training can maybe open up maybe the context of a passage, maybe the history of a passage. But we start going around and taking clauses and words out of their context. People with good common sense can call us on us, and they should. In fact, there at the bottom, it talks about the Bereans. There in Acts 17, 11. The Bereans were better in terms of Bible study than the people of Thessalonica. Why? Because they checked what was preached to them. They examined the scriptures daily. And those scriptures would, of course, have been the Old Testament and probably maybe some of the letters of Paul that they received later, as this was written by Luke afterwards. And so we want to try and be like the Bereans, believing in scripture, testing everything. Paul says, test the spirits. Test what you are told. 
And so that is what we want to do. That's the key concept of sola scriptura. Now, <coughs> one of the things it says here is sola scriptura means scripture alone is the final authority. Now, in other churches, let's say the medieval and modern Catholic Church, they believe in both scripture and tradition, and in many ways, the unwritten tradition. Let me give you two examples of fairly recent uh, Catholic theology. Back in 1870, uh, Pope Pius IX came up with the idea of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Basically, that Mary was born without sin, like Jesus was, and so that becomes a core of Catholic doctrine, the praying to Mary. Now, he did this without going to a council, which was normally what was done. And so you have also the doctrine, I should say, the tradition of papal infallibility, that when the Pope speaks on things of doctrine, it goes. Another one besides the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which again is very recent, around 1870, even the more recent type of putting tradition ahead of Scripture came from Pius XII. He was the Pope during World War II. And he came up with the idea of the Assumption of Mary. That means Mary, like with Jesus, did not face death, but is now up in heaven. And that's where you get the idea of praying to Mary. The, again, these are not from a thousand years ago. This is an unwritten tradition. There's nothing in the scriptures that says anything of this. It says Mary was a virgin. She became a follower of Jesus. She was at the cross, and she had other children, and she clearly was a woman of great faith and courage, and someone that we as Protestants need to look up to, but we don't worship her. We will see her on the Sea of Glass, and it'll be great to visit with her. But there's nothing in the Bible that says she was born without sin. That's only for Jesus the Son of God, and that she went to heaven. Uh, basically, you have Jesus, Enoch, and Elijah, who assumed. And so there you have tradition. And, and all churches have certain traditions. It's, the, the question is, does the tradition either push out certain tenets of Scripture, or in many other cases, it's expanded? And so in that, in both, expanding or limiting is where this comes into being. Let's go to Monday's lesson, the unity of Scripture. Again, Scripture was written, we believe Moses wrote the Pentateuch along with the book of Job, probably when he was a shepherd in Midian, maybe around 1450 B.C., and we believe the last book of the Bible had been written by the Apostle John, the Gospel of John, around 95 A.D. So we're looking at around 1,600 years. I, I mean, that's a lot of time. Uh, today it's 2020, so let's see. My goodness, 1,600 years. We're going back to around 600 A.D. I mean, that's at the beginning of the medieval age. Consider a sweep of time like that, over 1,600 years, and yet there is a type of unity to the Bible. Even in Leviticus, it's foreshadowing the presence of God there among the children of Israel during their exodus, and he is teaching them of the sacrifice of an unblemished lamb to forgive them of their sins and of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, having to go in to blot out the sins of the people. So it sets up the idea of the sacrifice for sin. And it's a foreshadowing of Jesus as the Passover lamb. So <coughs> there is a unity here throughout the Bible. Um, let's look at 2 Timothy 1.13. 2 Timothy 1.13. And again, this is Paul talking about, and he's writing this to Timothy. 
Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And of course, the words, of course, Paul's words are here in Scripture. And so his words, which were written under inspiration in his letters and in his preaching, are a key point when we read about what Jesus did for us on the cross and what he is still doing for us today and looking towards the end time, the second coming. So Paul's words form a key part of Scripture along with its own way, Leviticus. See, I was, but before I became a, a true Christian, I was like many people. I, I, I would view certain books of the Bible as more inspired than others. In fact, this is quite common. Uh, you will have many people, good people, who will say, yes, I believe in the Bible. What is paramount are the red verses that comes from Jesus. Then I'll choose my favorites, maybe the gospel, the gospels, maybe some of the letters of Paul. Uh, I don't know about that revelation. I will kind of put that there. Uh, Old Testament, you know, I, I like Isaiah. Uh, but, you know, the first, you know, I like some of those stories in Genesis, though, you know, the flood, that's, that's a nice myth, as is the creation and all that. So you have this idea of degrees of inspiration. And, <clears throat> and generally what happens is the books I like the best are the most inspired. And so, we bring in the subjective element, excuse me, we bring in the subjective element <coughs> instead of showing that all scripture is God-breathed. Um, and one of the things they will say is that the Old Testament and the New Testament are different. The Old Testament is made up of the law, uh, obedience, and things like that. Well, that's the old covenant. Well, the new covenant is where Jesus nailed the law to the cross, and we don't have to worry about the old covenant, the commandments, or whatever. Well, that's just not true. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 33, Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, talks about the New Covenant. It didn't come as a surprise to him. And here is what he says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he says, the children of Israel, they had the law, but it, w it was in stone. They just thought of it as something to obey. Give me the A. I'll follow everything perfectly, and then I'll, I'll get to heaven. Jeremiah and Jesus said the same thing. The law is timeless. The, the Ten Commandments are timeless. But you have to take them from the stone that they were written on and put them within your heart. So it can be a heartfelt religion. And that's what the new covenant is. You don't nail the Ten Commandments to the cross. You put them into your heart. And that is what Jeremiah is saying. He sees the difference between an old and a new covenant. And of course, that's what Jesus expanded on in his ministry uh, there in the New Testament. Uh, Tuesday's lesson, the clarity of Scripture. Now, here you have quite a few verses. I just want to look at a few here. Um, Matthew 21, 42 and Mark 12, 10 
deal with Jesus quoting from a messianic psalm, Psalm, I believe, 118, verse 23, and that the building stone became the chief cornerstone. Jesus uh, tells this after his parable of the tenants. I believe I preached on that a couple weeks ago. The tenants who killed the son, threw him out of the vineyard, and then the father basically destroyed those tenants. And Jesus made the application that the tenants are the religious leaders of Israel. And he was the son. And also in Luke, he uses the story of when David, who was on the run from Saul, David and his followers went into the, mo the, the holy place and ate the showbread, which they were not supposed to eat, only the, only the priest on those days. And so Jesus used the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament. He, of course, <laughs> helped to write it. In fact, the key point he made at the end of talking about David and his followers, when they're basically thinking, well, why are your disciples doing, quote, work on the Sabbath day? Jesus says, the Sabbath was not made, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, and the Lord, him. I know this because I am Lord of the Sabbath day. That's why I keep Sabbath, by the way. Jesus in the New Testament says, I am he who created that Sabbath day. I am Lord of the Sabbath. And so he again goes back to the beginning in Genesis, all the way from Genesis 1, all the way to the Gospels, and says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. It is timeless. It is eternal. And this is why my teachings reinforce that. We also see that in Matthew 19, verse 4, when we're talking about divorce. And the teachers come up to him and talk about a certain innovation that Moses had to make because of the hardness of their hearts. Um, let's go to Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. They're basically saying, look, Moses allowed us to have a certificate of divorce. We can leave our wives for whatever we want, and we're good if we give her a certificate of divorce, because that means, theoretically, she can be married again. And Jesus says, that's not the way it was in the beginning. You are going against the Holy Word. You're going against Scripture. God made them male and female, and God brought them together to cleave to each other as man and wife. And so he's saying, your certificate of divorce, Moses gave that to you because of the hardness of your hearts. But from the beginning it was not so, and in this word it was not so. And so you have the priesthood of all believers, and... As we go back to Sola Scriptura, I want to go back to Martin Luther. 1517, when he nailed his theses to the door at the church in Wittenberg, Germany, it was very important at that time because the printing press was coming. Gutenberg's printing press came in through Germany, 
And so these 99 theses were printed up and went all throughout Germany. And you could say made Luther a celebrity, controversial, but people read his theses. They read his writings. People read a lot in those days because now you could have books. And one of the things Luther did, because he could translate, he knew his Hebrew, he knew his Greek, he knew his Aramaic. He translated the Bible, known as the Luther Bible, into German, which was revolutionary and groundbreaking. Because before that time, the Bible was only in Latin. In some, in some type of churches, uh, it was put on a chain, locked right there at the pulpit, so no one could look at it or check and see, well, the priest is saying this, is it in God's Word? Well, you have to read Latin, and you have to be able to take it, literally, from the church, because that's the only place there was a Bible. So when these Luther Bibles came off the printing press and they were made in a great quantity and sold, so that brought the price down, the common person, the common person who was literate could read in their own language and discover these great truths which had been hidden from them from the churches that they had attended. And so you have the priesthood of all believers. Let's go to Wednesday's lesson. Scripture interprets Scripture. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The famous Bible study on the road to Emmaus is encapsulated in Luke 24, verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them, the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And then he makes his first appearance, his first, first post-resurrection appearance to the eleven, not the twelve anymore. Remember, uh, remember Judas is dead. But he comes to them and he says to them, verses 45 to 46, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Remember, scriptures in those days were the Old Testament. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So, this is what Jesus is pointing back to. He uses the Old Testament as the scriptures because that's what they had. And he says, it was proclaimed this way. You see it now. You are to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, here in Judea, here in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And of course, that is what has happened today. Why we are here, literally, probably about 1,900 years, or no, about 2,000 years after this was said. It is very important, whenever one studies Scripture, because this lesson is about interpretation or hermeneutics, is what is the context of the passage. I remember I had a teacher that said, when you tear a passage of Scripture out of context, it basically just becomes a pretext. And so the context is, what, what is the person talking about? What is the situation? Um, many of Jesus' parables, I, whenever I preach on them, I, I mainly say, who is the audience for this? And most of the audiences were the Jewish scribes and Pharisees and teachers. That's who Jesus was trying to reach. And so that would be the context of the passage. Who was Paul writing to? What church in particular? What were the issues or problems Paul was trying to address? Uh, did he begin his letter saying, this is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ? If he uses that word, that means he's having trouble with that church. Because that means people 
at that church that say like in Galatia, churches in Galatia, churches in Corinth, are basically saying he's no apostle, he wasn't around, he wasn't a follower when Jesus was on this earth, he never even saw him. And of course Paul would say, I did not see him when he was here in the flesh, but I saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus three years after his death, and that makes me an apostle because I had a conversion and a commission. So there's like context, and context is so important. In fact, it says here at the bottom of Wednesday's page, think of a doctrine such as the state of the dead. <clears throat> okay, what you'd want to do is develop that biblical doctrine. You would begin with Genesis 2-7, that man is made out of the dust of the earth, and ruach, the breath of God, and then these two form a nefesh, a living being. And then you go and say, what happens when one dies? The Spirit of God, the breath of God, goes back to God. We go into the grave. It is asleep. We will be raised again. And then you continue, uh, particularly with Jesus' raising of Lazarus. Lazarus had been dead for four days. Well, clearly, if his soul went directly to heaven, what's Jesus doing there trying to raise a man who's no longer in the tomb? And if he was going to do that, when he comes to the tomb, he should say, Lazarus, come on down. He doesn't. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And he says, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. He says, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes forth. So that's how you, you build it. You go from the Old Testament, you build the doctrine, and then you show it in its completeness. And then you would look at passages of the resurrection of those who are asleep in the grave with Paul. Thursday's lesson. Sola Scriptura and, and Ellen G. White. Mrs. White is, is God's messenger. She lived from 1827 to 1915. And several Men had been chosen to be God's messenger, and for various reasons, they turned it down. So he went to the weakest of the weak, a woman, a teenage girl, with a third grade education, and he chose her to be a spokesperson, a messenger to the people in the mid-19th century throughout her career, and her teachings apply to us today. Now, what is the relationship of Ellen White's writings to the Bible? She herself summed it up best. She said, I am the lesser light, leading you to the greater light of the Bible. Now, she was inspired by the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writings of the Bible. She would be known as a non-canonical prophet. This is the canon of Scripture. Uh, remember the prophet Daniel the one who said to David, you are the man, O king, there is a book of Nathan. It was written under inspiration, but is not a part of the canon. And that's where we would pray, place Mrs. White, a non-canonical prophet. Her writings are not on the same level as the scripture. She herself says that. But if you read her writings, it should lead you back to study the Bible in much more greater terms. She never wanted her writings to be an addition to or to take the place of the Bible. In fact, when I first came, when I first visited the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the things I wanted to look at is what was in the pew racks. And it was just the Bible. Might be King James Version, New King James Version, NIV, but in Seventh-day Adventist churches, in our pew racks, you will have just the Bibles. You don't have the writings of Mrs. White. She would, she, she would not want that. Now, I have a couple books of hers that are some of my favorites. First book I read about her was Steps to Christ. Prayer, The Sinner's Need of a Savior, God's Love for Us. Wonderful book, I highly recommend it. And one of my personal favorites, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And so she is a remarkable woman known for her humility, um, and she lived a very good life, lived to the age of 87, and she made a difference. Um, she made a difference in this world. She is the most highly read
female author of all time. And she points people to Jesus, to salvation by grace and grace alone, and she, she in her writings, you can see the personality of her over time, which as a historian I find fascinating. Just like you can tell the personalities of all the writers here in Scripture, you can see her personality. And so, as we come to the end, uh, this remember Sola Scriptura, this book, this is the foundation of all biblical Christianity. Thank you for joining us, and in a couple minutes, we will have our worship. God bless you.